Right, so let's get started. So who are Training Link? We're a distance learning training provider. Uh, we've been doing distance learning for 26 years. I've been with the organization just for 18 months, but I've also been teaching, managing, and various other roles in relation to AAT for, I think this is my 25th year, 25th five in, in September, I think it comes to. Um, I've always specialized in accounting, bookkeeping, um, and that's what Training Link do as well. We only do accounting and bookkeeping. So it's a niche market, but we make sure we focus all of our materials around uh, accounting and bookkeeping. It's all we do. Uh, when we launch Quals 22, we will also be launching online live classes. Um, and as of Quals 22, we're going to be publishing our materials for the greater public as well. So if you're not one of our students at the moment, hopefully you might do it at a, a later level. Uh, but our books are going to be generally available alongside the other publishers uh, for Quals 22 onwards. So I'm going to go through through the it, it, wages control account is the first subject but i thought it'd be worthwhile just making sure that all the building blocks that come to that place are there as well uh, the thing about accounting is it is a building block subject and if you're currently at level two this information will all be used at level three and level four so it is really important that you try and understand it as you go along rather than just completing any activities that you so what is a control account? A control account is simply used to bring information into one place from a number of other accounts. So examples that you may already be aware of in your studies, we've got the receivables or SLCA, debtors control account, a payables control account, also known as PLCA and creditors control account, and the wages control account. And finally, the other one that I've got there as an example is the VAT control. All of these accounts are used to bring a number of different accounting information together into one place. So the two that we're going to try and focus on today are the wages control account, VAT control account. But if you've got any questions on control accounts in general, put them in the chat box and Jaden will be asking me those questions. Uh, at a later stage, so hopefully I'll be able to. So recording payroll transactions. There are a couple of different ways to use it, but to, to achieve that task. But one of the ways is to use a wages control account, and that's what we're going to look at today. So there are two main components to payroll costs to an employer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at those costs we look at before we look at how we record them. Because if you, if you whenever you're studying accounting, if you think about what you're trying to, to achieve before you start thinking, am I going to make a debit? Am I going to make a credit? Which account does it go in? If you think about the component parts first, I like to think it's a very practical subject and it starts to make more sense as you're doing your learning. So there's two main components to payroll cost to an employer. There's the gross wages. That's the amount of money that we feel that we earn. So if we work 40 hours and we get paid 20 pounds an hour, that's going to be 800 pounds. So that's what we think of as our wages, if you like, as employees. But to an employer, that's only the first part of the cost that, that, that they incur. The other ones are the employer's contributions. So these days, employers may contribute towards your pension scheme. Most do. Uh, but also, they have to pay other costs associated with it as well. And we'll look at those very shortly. So gross wages, first of all, let's look at a breakdown of what gross wages in, uh, include. Unfortunately, still, we don't get to keep our entire wage. Government want a bit of it. Other people want a bit of it. So before it hits our bank account, deductions are removed from those gross wages. So let's have a look at those deductions. Employees, national insurance, and this example that we're going to work on, that's £3,000. PAYE, our income tax that we need to pay, 3500 in this example. 
Membership fees, well, when you become AAT members, after you've fully, um, you, you, you fully passed all your qualifications, um, you may want to pay those membership fees. And in some organisations, it's possible to have those deducted directly from your wages and your employer pays those over. Employees pension. Some organisations uh, will give you a pension contribution from the employer, but they expect you to make a contribution yourself as well. So total deductions in this example, £8,900. So if we wanted to work out our net pay from there, the gross wage was £30,000, total deductions £8,900, giving us net pay that this organisation has to pay out. This is a monthly pay packet, by the way. And if, if some of you out there are earning £21,100, good on you. I don't. Uh, but this is for multiple employees uh, in, in a monthly pay. But in this one, £30,000 gross wage minus £8,900 total deductions, leaving £21,100 that needs to be physically paid out to the employee. Got that there. We can check that back because if we do the calculation, total deductions, add the net pay on, and it brings us back to our £30,000 starting. And that's one of the important things in accounting in general, but to do with wages as we are doing here. If you can make sure you can calculate things back to the starting point, you're going to give you, it's going to give you confidence in the exam when you do it. So it, having a check always helps in accounting. So employers' contributions. In this one, the employer's national insurance contribution is going to be £3,300. And they also make a pension contribution for their employer, employees, and that is £3,750 in this example. Total contribution then of other employers' contributions, £7,050. Just so we're bringing that information together. We haven't started making the entries yet, but I just wanted to introduce the costs that are associated. So let's have a look then at the accounts that we're going to use to record these transactions. We're going to use the wages expense account, the wages control account, the pensions liability account, HMRC account, membership fees account, and a bank account. And you'll notice there on two of them, I've put the word liability actually in their title. If you're at level two whilst you're watching this video, or if you're thinking about moving into accounting and you're watching this for that reason, being able to identify whether it's an asset, liability, income or expense account really helps the thought processes that you're going to go through. So make sure when you look at an account, you're thinking to yourself, wages expense account. Well, what type of account is that? Well, luckily in that example, it says the word expense in it, so it's a bit of a giveaway. But HMRC account, what type of account's that? Bank account, what type of account's that? We're also going to look at the journal entries. Now, the journal is not an account. It isn't part of the double entry bookkeeping in the way that I'm going to present it today. It's, it's similar to an, any other book of original entry. So now we've put those figures that we looked at earlier into the wages expense account to start. It's an expense account. And if we're increasing an expense, it gets a debit entry. And that's what you can see already presented to you. I've put the gross wages in as a total figure, the employer's national insurance and the employer's pension. The double entry for that wages expense is the wages control account. So we had a debit entry in the wages expense, so it's going to get a credit entry in the wages control. If you were asked to show a journal entry or if you need to do a journal entry in your day to day work as you're recording wages, I've now included the journal entry in there as well. Now, the important thing with the journals to remember is it says account name. It's not saying 
the, the detail as it as it does here in the T account. It says account name. So the wages expense account is receiving a debit entry for a total of 37,050. And the wages control account is receiving a credit entry for 37,050. It would be just as acceptable for you to list the debit entries as set out in the wages expense account. Equally, it would be just as acceptable to list the wages control separate entries there. If you were to face this in an assessment or a practice question, have a look at the number of lines you've got available. And if it only gives you two, it's highly likely it's looking for a total. So let's now start focusing on the wages controller. We've brought those costs together from the expense account, but we now need to distribute them to their asset or liability account. So that's what we're going to start doing first. Now, the first one we're going to look at in this example, it, it was the last thing that we calculated when I took you through all the figures. But because of the way we're going to group information together, it made sense to put net pay at the top. And as I've put in back brackets, that's going to come from the bank account because that's the physical amount of money that the employer is going to have to pay out to the employees. The journal entry for that, therefore, will be debit wages control account, credit bank account. And we can see that there in the T account um, for, for the bank. So you've got a debit entry for uh, wages control, credit entry for the bank account, and the journal entry there just showing how it's recorded. This is not part of the double entry. Double entry takes place between the two tiers. That's just a summary of the book of original. So the next one, I've now put in the membership fees and we need to record those into the accounts. So again, I've drawn up a journal entry for it, debiting the wages control account, crediting the membership fees account. Now, you don't necessarily have to put debit first, but it is good practice whenever you're doing journals to put your debit entry first within the journal. Let's show that in the T account. Dead straightforward. We had a debit entry in the wages control account, and we've got a credit in the membership fees account. Just quickly pause on that for the thought process. Why is the membership fees account a credit entry? Well, your employer has taken it out of your wages and the employer, because that's whose accounts we're looking at, now owes that money to your membership organization, whatever that might be, whether it be a professional membership fee or whatever the reason is. It could be a club subscription fee, whatever it might be. Your employer now owes that money to whoever is supposed to be receiving. Therefore, it's a liability to the employer, and that's why it's a credit in the membership fees account. Now, let's bring the other entries in. So we've got the rest of the gross wages, the employee's national insurance, the income tax, the PAYE, and the employee's pension. We're also at this stage going to bring in the employer's NI and the employer's pension. Good point to raise on this, and it's one of the reasons I, I found in the past that, that students can sometimes have difficulty with wages control account. If you're presented with the information via the wages control account in the first place, Unlike I went through the breakdown of what all these costs were at the beginning of this video, if you've just been presented with the wages control account, as many people are, people look at it and think, well, why have we got a double entry between the employer's national insurance and the employer's pension contributions within the same account? Well, as I hope you've already started to see, the double entry for the credit side of the wages control account was actually to the wages expense account. 
The debit entries, the ones that we're looking now, are showing how those costs are distributed to the asset and liability account. So they aren't a double entry to each other. They just happen to be in the same account and the transactions apply to, the double entry to the transactions apply to different accounts. You'll see that again at the end when I bring up um, an overview of all the transactions. So let's have a look at how we're going to post these final five uh, transactions within the control. First of all, we're going to produce uh, to, to produce the journal for the costs owed, the transactions owed to HMRC. So anything to do with tax, basically. Well, within these figures, and hopefully you can see they've become emboldened, employees' national insurance is a tax, and we pay it to HMRC. PAYE, or income tax, is a tax, and we pay it to HMRC. And then the employer's national insurance contribution is an additional tax that needs to be pay, paid to HMRC. So we're going to add those together, £3,000 employees NI, 3,300 employers NI, and the 3,500 pounds PAYE. So the total amount in this period payable to HMRC by the employer is 9,800 pounds. We've already got the debit entries in the wages control account. So we've just summarized it as a total there. And the opposite entry is going to be to the HMRC account for a credit of £9,800. Let's show that in T account format. So the credit entry of £9,800 adds up to the three debit entries that we've identified. So your double entry is complete. That's just going to leave us with one final set of transactions that we need to record. And that's for the pension contributions, both employees and employers. The two figures to add together, 2,200 and 3,750, means that the total is 5,950. We already have the debit entries within the wages control account, and we simply need to record their opposing entry for £5,950 in the pensions liability. We've seen the summary there in the journal, so let's see that in the T account. Uh, 200 plus 3,750 is the 5,950, and that double entry is completed within the pensions liability account. Hopefully that's all really quite clear. If not, please do ask the questions of Jay. So back there to the summary of the wages control account that we've already now posted out. And the wages control account must always balance off. There should not be a balance carried down. These are the costs on the credit side that the uh, employer has encountered. And on the debit side, it shows how those have been distributed. That's the purpose of the wages control account. This is what it's cost. This is where they've gone to. And let's make sure we've covered every aspect that was in there because it, it needs to make sure that that's accurately posted. So finally, to summarize that, and I appreciate I am going through this at a fair pace, but you can watch the video back and I know a recording will be available later as well. Any questions you've got, please ask Jaden. But we've got a summary there in T account format. The wages expense account that in my way of working started the process off. So you had your debit wages expense, credit wages control. And then we needed to post those costs out, as I've said, debiting the wages expense and posting it to the other accounts. The bank account was a credit entry because it reduced the amount of money that would be in the bank. And all of the others are liabilities. That your business, your employer, if you're thinking about it from your wages perspective, 
now owes that money to HMRC. They're all credit entries as the bottom three are liabilities showing that they owe that money now. Let's see that again. It's only a summary sheet, de depending on wh what questions or how you're thinking about it at the time. You may be thinking of it more from a journal account format. Uh, and there we've got the journal entries for posting the accounts. I've missed off the original one for putting wages expenses because I wanted you to see the four main ones that actually looked at the distribution. But you can look back at the start of the year to see. That was very short and sweet, I hope. Um, have we got any questions? Hi, Paul, can you hear me? Hello? I mean, Mark, sorry. Yes, I Mark, can hear you, yeah, Jane. I didn't know whether you had a technical thing we were speaking to Paul. Yes, how can I help? Don't worry. Um, yes, we do have a few questions here about four, so I'm just going to read them out for you. Um, so the first one, which was asked by, pardon me, something I don't put to this. It's a Relica Florentina. She's asked bank account, is that net wages? The bank account is the net wages, yes, because the net wages is the physical amount of money that will be paid to the employee. So we credit the bank account to show the money coming out. We debit the wages control account to show that that aspect has been completed. Okay, sweet. Uh, we've got another question here from Richie Rich. He's asked, when calculating tax, um, is this applied after the uh, EE slash ERNI deduction or before? Also, uh, similarly, is the deduction applied before or after tax? Well, you also have other things of, of, of that nature when the deductions in terms of the actual calculations that take place could be an entire different where webinar in themselves because there are lots of different aspects to it. We all get an allowance before we have to pay uh, tax and that needs to be taken into account. Um, so in, in terms of that, how the tax and stuff's calculated, a little bit out of the scope of this one. Um, so it, you would need to look up the, all the various rules. I'm only, it sounds a little bit like I'm dodging the question, but it's to, to answer those questions directly without going into all the other complications of how you work out uh, the taxation, the net contributions, etc. It takes in a bigger subject. Okay, no, fair enough. Uh, another question here from uh, Paula and G is asked: Employers' pension is that net pension or private pension? Uh, the employers' pension. It depends on how your employer is is making a contribution to that. These days, all um, staff, or the majority of staff anyway, barring a couple of, of, of restrictions, are entitled to have their employers pay towards their pension. Um, it's where you have what is called a contribu contributory pension scheme. You pay a per per percentage towards it, and your employer does too. The percentage level is different across so many different employers. All right, perfect. And the final one here, well, actually, I'm going to double check to see if there's any more that's come through, but the one that I've got here is from uh, Babaraj, and he's asked, or she, pardon me, um, the journal for employers NI is wages expense, debit, wages control, then credit. Is that correct? Can you just read that question again? Because Yeah, certainly. So it says the journal for employers NI, is it wages expense, debit, wages control, credit? It depends which aspect of it you were, you were asking the question about. Uh, I'll just quickly flick back to the starting slides. So in the initial stage, where you're recording the NI in the wages expense account and the credit side of the wages control account, it is employers NI, debit, wages expense, credit, wages control account. When you later come to post the entry to um, your HMRC account, quickly flick back to that slide, 
in that one, we are debiting wages control account, crediting HMRC account. Okay. So it depends on which aspect of it the question was coming from. But hopefully that answers both. I see. Okay, not to worry. Um, so sorry, Richie has just come back to say thanks for your answer, but I know that there are other allowances, but if we ignore those uh, for now, how does it work in general? So I believe he was asking about the calculating of tax. Um, you know, the question that I asked, I'll just ask the question. The calculation of the tax is, if you forget all the other bits and just go for the basic, gross wages minus your allowance and you calculate your tax based on that. If you're missing out all those other bits and pieces, but there are lots of other bits and pieces that you're missing. Okay. So that, that's fine. We'll see if he comes back uh, from that, but no, that's fine. And so I think just one more with uh, Paul, let's come back to say, do we have to pay tax where we cash in our pension? Um, pensioners do pay tax. Uh, again, you uh, on the income that you gain from your pension, if it's sufficient and is above your allowance, then yes, you pay tax on your pension. Perfect. So I think we'll let you go ahead for now. If we've got any other questions, we'll ask it at another question point. Okay, lovely. So another question in bookkeeping controls that students uh, come across, sometimes they have issues, sometimes they don't, is the VAT control. So let's have a look at that now. We've got it there in T-account format. Now, the VAT control account, a little bit like the bank account, is one of those that can be an asset or it can be a liability, depending on the, the stage or, or the transactions that have taken place. If HMRC owe you money, it will have a balance on the debit side. If you owe them money, it will have a balance on the credit side. So, in the VAT control account itself, Anything that decreases the liability to HMRC will be a debit entry. And anything that increases the liability will have a credit entry. More often than not, in successful businesses, you are collecting more VAT in than you're paying out. So it will usually be a liability account. But there are occasions when that might not be the case and HMRC end up owing you money. So let's have a look at some of those. Now I've presented this in a slightly different way because I don't want you just focusing on and memorizing, oh, do I, this goes on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Hopefully none of you still do that with T accounts, calling them left and right, debit entries and credit entries is the, is the more appropriate. But just to try and think about it in a slightly different way. So let's have a look at this example. The first one states balance owing to HMRC at the start of the period. Well, the key thing to that statement is we owe it to HMRC. If we owe somebody some money, it's a liability. And liabilities always get a credit entry. So that's the type of thought process that I want us to go through as we're looking at the control account entries in this way. So we owed them money, we identified it was a liability, and we know that liabilities get a credit entry. Now, with all the other transactions, we're going to have a look at would this increase or decrease the liability to HMRC? So we've got the VAT from the purchaser's day book. Now, this is where we've paid VAT as a business on the purchases we've made. Well, if we've paid it out as we've bought the purchases, we don't owe that money to HMRC. But as a VAT registered organization, we can claim that money back. VAT does not belong to the organization that is charging it. They only collect it on behalf of the government, of HMRC. So we're going to have a look at that now. 
So if we've got VAT from purchase day book, that reduces our liability and therefore it's going to get a debit entry. Now the VAT from the sales day book, this is where we have collected VAT in on behalf of the government. So it increases our liability as a business to pay that VAT over to HMRC. If it's increasing the liability, it therefore gets a credit entry. Sales returns day book. Well, this is where our customers, for whatever reason, have sent goods back to us. Now, if they've sent goods back to us, they aren't going to pay us that money that would have been initially recorded via the VAT in the sales day book. So if we're not collecting that money from them, we can't pay that to HMRC. So the VAT that is on the sales returns day book is a debit entry because it reduces our liability. Equal and opposite. Purchase returns day book is where we've returned stuff to our suppliers. If we've returned stuff, we're not going to pay it. And therefore, we won't have paid VAT out. And in the purchase day book, where we originally recorded the fact that we were paying VAT on a purchase, we now need to reduce that clawback, if you want to call it, within our VAT liability. So we'll get a credit entry for the purchase returns day. So I'll just take a quick drink. We've now got the two discount uh, books, the discount allowed day book and the uh, discount received day book. Well, let's have a look at what they are. Whenever you're making a decision in these sort of scenarios, don't start thinking straight away, looking at the T account or looking at this table that we've been presented in and just think to yourself, is that a debit or a credit entry? Make sure you take the time, first of all, to think, what is a discount allowed day book? What does it show? <coughs> well, discount allowed is where we've allowed a discount to our customers. Therefore, the VAT on that discount that we've given them isn't going to be paid to us. So we can't <coughs> pay money over to HMRC that we haven't received. So the discount allowed day book reduces the liability to HMRC. Discount received, on the other hand, is where we've been given a discount for prompt payment from our suppliers. And if we've been given a discount, we're not going to pay it. And therefore, we can't write it off against the, the VAT that we have received. Therefore, that increases again our liability to HMRC. This figure in the purchaser's day book, just to clarify that, will have been the full invoice amount. So both the purchase returns day book and the discount received day book are both reducing the amount of that original invoice. Therefore, that's why both the purchase returns day book and the discount received day book are credit entries within the VAT control account itself. We claim the VAT back here, and now because we can't fully claim all of that back because of returns and discounts, we need to put it back into the figures that were generated via the sales and the opening uh, liability. Now we come to the next, to the last one. And this one, you need to give a little bit of thought, especially in the way that I've described it as we're going through making a decision. A couple of different ways that you can think about, should this be a debit entry or credit entry in the VAT control account? Excuse me, I was in my voice there. Uh, in the VAT control account. Um, we'll start off with what it would mean in terms of the bank. Now, I don't often like going back to the bank account um, in terms of it, because it is, it is one of the ways that people think, oh, well, what would that be when it's finally paid? Um, but sometimes I like you to think about the transactions actually in more detail. But in this particular example, I'm going to start off with the easier one first, the bank account option. Well, if we receive money from somebody, 
it would increase our bank account. And an asset, when it's been increased, receives a debit entry. So if we debit the bank account, and the opposite entry is the VAT control account, that's going to receive a credit entry. And this is where people sometimes, where they're really starting to think about it, think, well, but actually, if I've received a refund, they've paid me some money. But by putting a credit entry into my VAT control account, aren't I increasing my liability? Well, if you think about it, HMRC wouldn't pay you a refund if there hadn't been a debit balance on your VAT control account in the first place. And it would have happened in a previous period. So you don't get your money back straight away. So this VAT refund in the period that we're dealing with must mean in a previous period, this specific organization had paid out more VAT than it collected in. And therefore, HMRC sent them a refund. And it's going on the credit side because the original balance that created it would have been a debit balance on the VAT account. Let's see if that makes even more sense, hopefully, when, if it doesn't already, when we show it in a T account uh, method. Now, in this example, we had the VAT control account as an opening balance, and it was owing, so it was on the credit side. And then we've just listed all of these transactions into the account on the side that we said it was going to take place. You can't even really call this a journal. It's simply a table of activities for recording the transaction because journal entries always require a debit entry and a credit entry for each transaction. We've simply been asked in this case to list the action that will be taken within the control account by indicating whether it's a debit or. So if we quickly look at that VAT control account there to see what's happened. We have a closing balance, balance carried down of £9,150, and we balance the two accounts off to give us the £13,500 total. Balance the balancing figure, give making sure that the totals of both the debit side and the credit side each other. This organisation now therefore owes HMRC £9,150. And that's just a brief run through of how to think about a VAT control account. Has anybody got any questions on VAT control? Uh, so we had a couple of questions. Just going to wait to see if those come through or if any more come through. Um, the first one I've got from Paula again. So she was just querying in relation to VAT. She was saying VAT records for making tax digital. Do we need to do anything differently? In terms of the VAT records for making tax digital, it will depend on which software. They look very different. For example, you have uh, input tax and output tax, some of uh, you know, different tax. The descriptions of how those taxes are recorded vary from one package to another. Whether you, I'm not going to name the other the packages, I suppose, but I will anyway, say zero, QuickBooks, any of those. At least I've said more than one, so they can't claim I'm advertising one more than the other. They all use different descriptions. Um, but it still gets brought together in the same way. Um, many of them post directly to your VAT return, uh, obviously, especially as part of making tax digital. So to give a definitive answer, we would have to have... Um, a specific package in mind and i'm not an, an expert on those packages so i'm afraid if you can ask me a question on sage zero or quickbooks or which any one of those i would need to refer that to somebody else um because I, I don't know all of those packages. okay not to worry and uh, got another question here from becky crabtree she was asking why would the company owe nine thousand one hundred and fifty if 6,400, sorry, if, let me read it again. Uh, why would the company owe 9,150 if 6,400 was a refund? That's a really good question. I'm, thank you for asking that question. I was, 
I nearly went through it in more detail as I was going through it. I did mention the reason, um, but it's a really good question. I'm glad that that shows that somebody was pay, paying attention. Um, that £6,400 relates to a previous period where the balance brought down would have been a debit balance. Since that period, even though that was taken into account, other transactions have taken place, meaning that the balance brought down figure in this particular period has already overtaken the debit balance from the period that the refund refers to. So, in effect, th those differences have already been taken care of in previous control account periods. So now when the refund is posted, it's readjusting those other transactions that have taken place in previous periods. But you're still entitled to it because in the period that it relates to, a refund was up. Sweet, so no, perfect. And uh, sorry, I just wanted to go back to the previous topic very quickly. We did have, uh, you know, the question by Richie Rich. I will ask it again, he, he slightly clarified. Uh, so I'm just going to read it again. So it was saying, when calculating tax, uh, so sorry, yeah, when calculating tax is applied after the EE slash ER NI deduction or before, um, he was asking, what about NI? So you gave a brief overview about tax, but he was, I think he was more specifically asking about the NI. He was asking, uh, how does that work? There are different rates and there are different boundaries. So it depends again on the detail of what it is. It really is a subject in itself. I'm sorry if I sound like I'm dodging that question, but to give you a straight answer to that isn't looking at enough detail to do it. But it, in terms of your NI contributions, they are based on your gross pay wages within boundaries. Uh huh. Not to worry, um, that's not a problem at all. I can't see any other questions as it stands that's pertaining to, actually, oh, wait, one more. Um, so I've got one here from uh, Jeff, which says, does that mean that the refund, so sorry, does that mean that had the refund not been received, the balance owing to HMRC would be 2750 Doing a quick mental arithmetic, that, that looks pretty much like it to me, yes. Yeah, okay, so that uh, that's about it. So thank you very much, Mark. No uh, again, we appreciate you coming up with this Facebook Live.